Hi, in this video we're going to talk about sequences and series. Here's the idea. A sequence is a list of numbers separated by commas. So 1, comma, 2, comma, 3, comma, etc. The limit of that sequence is infinity. Now sequences are essentially the background material. What we will mainly be focusing on in this chapter is series. A series is a list of numbers separated by plus signs. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, etc. That series also goes to infinity. So what we'll be exploring is which types of series go to infinity and which ones don't. These curly brackets stand for the set of all dot dot dot, where the dot 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 is filled in by whatever's in the brackets. If we had brackets with a n inside starting at n equals 0 to infinity, that would stand for the set of all a n starting from n equals 0 and continuing as n goes to infinity. For other notations, we can have a summation symbol. This stands for the summation of dot dot dot, and then whatever is here would continue the sentence. So a more complete example is that we could have the summation of all a n's starting at n equals 1 and continuing as n goes to infinity. The bracket notation is used when you have a collection of numbers that are separated by commas. Those are sequences a1, comma, a2, comma, a3. Now the summation symbol is used when you have a collection of numbers that are being added it up. A1 plus, A2 plus, A3, etc. The first question to ask about a sequence is where is it approaching as the indexing goes to infinity? And the only difference between limits that you did in Calculus 1 and limits that we're doing with sequences is that sequences are a discrete list. There's a first and a second and a third and a fourth. This doesn't happen when you have x involved because usually x is a real number that doesn't just jump from one one to two, but includes everything in between, like 1.1 1 .1 and 1.1214 and 1.4321, right? These are discrete for n values of one to two to three. They're integers, so we can list them out with commas separating them. So the first thing to remember is limit laws. You've already seen this in Calculus 1. As long as the individual limits exist, you can separate over plus signs. You can pull constants out in front. You can break it down into pieces that are multiplied or divided as long as the denominator is not equal to zero. We also have the squeeze theorem, which is that suppose I had three things where the ans were less than the bns and the bns were less than the cns. So if the smaller one and the bigger one is approaching L, then the middle one has to also approach L. I hope you remember from Calculus 1 that L'Hopital's rule applies whenever you have a limit where the numerator and the denominator either both approach zero or both approach infinity. Then L'Hopital's rule says that you can take this limit by taking the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom and take the limit of the resulting expression. Let's start with a super basic sequence, simply 1 over n. Because the n values are jumping only in between integers, the sequence can be visualized like a set of discrete dots on the graph. So the first dot at n equals 1 is 1. The second dot at n equals 2 is a half, etc. However, evaluating the limit is exactly the same as everything else that you've learned in calculus 1. The numerator is 1 and the denominator approaches infinity. That means it's 1 over infinity which approaches 0. You can also see that on the graph. As the n values are getting higher and higher, the heights of these dots are approaching a height of 0. Now again, you can visualize this sequence as a collection of dots. Notice then the numerator is approaching infinity and so is the denominator. What we're going to do is a little trick here. Let's just connect these dots with a solid line and symbolically replacing n's with x's because the x's are all real values. Now why the heck am I doing this? Well because it's infinity over infinity I wish I could apply L'Hopital's rule but L'Hopital's rule only applies if I have something that's differentiable. I switch into the x's in order to denote that I'm connecting these dots with a differentiable line and now we can apply L'Hopital's rule by taking the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom. X is cancel and we get 4 sixths or 2 thirds as the answer. We're going to do some limits involving exponential functions. 2 to the x is increasing and 1 over 2 to the x is decreasing. Be 
because here the number overall is getting bigger, but here it's the denominator that's getting bigger. So this function approaches zero. Similar for other fractions. So as a general trend, a number raised to the x power that will be increasing if this r value is greater than one. And it'll be decreasing like this purple graph if the r value is a fraction. The limit as x goes to infinity gives us different values in the two different cases. For the blue graph, the height of the function goes to infinity if x goes to infinity. And for the purple graph, the height of the function goes to zero if x goes to infinity. Now remember, in this video we're talking about sequences, which are like a collection of discrete dots at n equals 1, n equals 2, comma n equals 3, etc. These things are called geometric sequences. They're of the format r, not to the x, but to the n, where n is an integer. And as you can see, based on these graphs, r to the n goes to infinity if r is greater than 1, and it goes to 0 if r is less than 1. Let's do an example. All we have to do is collecting 3 over 4, quantity to the n power, and then we just say, oh, that's a geometric sequence. Since that 3 fourths is less than 1, by the properties on the previous slide, the value for this limit is equal to 0. The way to think about this problem is to just look at the dominant terms here, 2 to the n over 5 to the n. That should be a geometric sequence, with the r value being 2 fifths. But we really have to be a bit careful. It's just got this extra minus 1 here and an extra minus 1 in the exponent. So let's be careful here. Let's first notice, if you plug in n equals 1, the numerator is 0. If you plug in n equals 2, the numerator is going to get bigger. If you plug in n equals 3, the numerator is going to get even bigger. So what we can first notice is that as long as the n values are greater than or equal to 1, then this sequence is a positive sequence, except for the first term, which is equal to 0. In other words, we can write down this relation. 0 is less than or equal to this sequence, just by plugging in numbers and testing it out. Now, let's notice that this minus 1 can be discarded if we make an inequality, because over here on the right, the numerator is bigger. We can separate 2 to the n minus 1 as 2 to the n times 2 to the minus 1. Then we can pull 2 to the minus 1 outside the limit. Now we have what we want, which is that this is a geometric sequence with r value of 2 fifths. Since the 2 fifths is less than 1, this geometric sequence approaches 0. So the limit that we're looking for is somewhere in between 0 and 0. By the squeeze theorem, this limit must also be 0. Let's talk about the next topic, which is on alternating sequences. Now all of the sequences that we've done up to this point in the video were positive. So suppose that we had a minus 1 to the n power in here times a bn, where the bn's were positive. What happens if you test it out with various n values? If n is equal to 1, I get a minus sign, so it's negative. If n is equal to 2, then minus 1 squared is positive 1, so it's positive. If n is equal to 3, then minus 1 cubed is a minus, so it's a negative. And as you can see, it alternates plus minus plus minus, depending on whether the n value is even or odd. We're going to establish a rule for these. So look at the green dots. These are essentially the absolute value of the sequence. Now these purple dots are the negative of the absolute value. Now we can set up an inequality, which is that the black dots is going to be somewhere in between the positive part, which are the green dots, and the negative, which are the purple dots. Now we can use the squeeze theorem and write down a rule that's true for alternating sequences, which is that suppose that the absolute value of the alternating sequence approaches zero. In other words, this approaches zero on the right, and this approaches zero on the left as well. So therefore, by the squeeze theorem, the original alternating version must also approach zero. So here's the rule that we've established. If the positive part of the series approaches zero, then the alternating version with the plus minus included also approaches zero. Let's for the moment just ignore the plus minus that's alternating and just look at the positive part of the sequence. Why don't we use L'Hopital's rule? We can apply L'Hopital's rule again, infinity over 2 approaches infinity. We determine that the positive part goes to infinity. So the picture looks something like this. Positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. But the individual terms are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The entire sequence, including the plus minus, does not exist. Let's do another problem. So let's just consider the positive part. As you can see, the numerator and denominator both approach infinity. We switch to x's, we apply L'Hopital, apply L'Hopital's rule again, and we get 2 over infinity which goes to zero. Now we can actually use that rule that we learned a couple of slides ago. The alternating version of the sequence also must approach zero for our final answer for this limit. 
the general rule is that logarithms, they go to infinity much slower than a polynomial would. So here's a list of growth rates of basic functions. You may have seen this in Calculus 1. Logarithms grow the slowest. Polynomials go to infinity faster. Exponentials go to infinity even faster. Factorials go faster than that. And something called n to the n power uh, goes even faster than factorials. Here we get infinity for the numerator and infinity for the denominator, but actually L'Hopital's rule is a bit difficult to apply here. If you switch into x's, the denominator becomes x to the x power, and you can find that derivative, but it's a little bit of a challenging problem. It involves logarithmic differentiation. You kind of have to do it on the side. Anyways, this is easier if we just use the growth rates. So since the denominator grows a lot faster than the numerator does, this limit is equal to zero. And let's do one more of these. Exponentials grow faster than logarithms. So here we've got the numerator approaching infinity much, much faster than the denominator, so overall it goes to infinity. We covered a lot of information about sequences. Remember your basics. 1 over 0 is infinity, 1 over infinity is 0. Limit laws, you can always break things down into pieces or pull constants out in front. You can apply L'Hopital's rule in the cases of infinity over infinity or 0 over 0. We also introduced new information on alternating sequences, and we got a rule for that. As long as the positive part goes to zero, then the alternating version would go to zero as well. That was by the squeeze theorem. And finally, we have geometric sequences. There's one more thing that we can add on to our list here, which is that what if the r value for the geometric sequence was a negative number? That would be like having a negative number in parentheses raised to the n power. Using basic algebra, that would be like negative 1 to the n times r to the n. In other words, if the r value is negative, that basically basically boils down to an alternating sequence because the minus 1 to the n factors out. But then remember that we have this rule, which is that as long as the positive part goes to 0, then the alternating part would go to 0 as well. So actually, for the geometric sequences, we can include the possibility that the r values are negative. So here's an updated version of the geometric sequence. As long as the absolute value of r is greater than 1, then the limit does not exist. And as long as the absolute value of r is less than 1, then the limit is equal to 0. So just one more quick example. As you can see, we can do a little bit of algebra and separate things, the negative 1 and the positive 3. It's a constant, so it comes out in the front, and then the rest of it, negative 1 to the n, 3 to the n over 8 to the n, that can be collected all together into negative 3 over 8 quantity to the n power. This falls under the category of a geometric sequence where the r value is negative 3 eighths, and as long as the absolute value of the r is is less than 1, then this limit does go to 0. So our final answer is 0. Okay, now I'm going to give you a brief introduction to series. So this is a list of numbers, a1, a2, a3, a4, separated by plus signs. Here you can see that I started the indexing at 3. That's just in order to emphasize that the location where you start the indexing actually doesn't really matter. It just depends on what's convenient for the problem. The indexing is really not contributing to the overall convergence and divergence of the sequence or of the series. So anyways, series are the ones with pluses in the middle, and that's what we're going to look at in the next couple slides. Remember, the summation symbol means that I'm adding up c times a to the n. That would be the same thing as c times a1 plus c times a2 plus c times a3. Dot, dot, dot. As you can see, there's a c value that can be factored out of this whole thing, so I could just sum up the a's and then multiply by c afterward. Now, the first thing we have to know about series, if I had a bunch of numbers, a1, a2, a3, all added up, these individual things, which are infinite in number, individual, these things better be getting smaller and smaller. Otherwise, the summation could not possibly approach anything except for infinity. Suppose that the individual terms were like approaching 10. As I add these things up, this one's closer to 10 and closer to 10 and closer to 10. And as you can imagine, that's just going to add up to infinity. So the divergence test says that if the individual terms do not approach zero, then once you start summing them up, that will certainly be divergent. Let's look at this one. We're doing the summation of this expression. Just look at the limit as n goes to infinity of the individual terms of this summation. Essentially, you get infinity over infinity, and there's a lot of different ways of dealing with this. You can either do L'Hopital's rule or you can divide
abide by the highest power trick or the trick where if powers are the same, then you just look at the coefficient. The answer of this limit is one eighth. Each individual thing that we're adding up is getting closer and closer to one eighth. So the individual terms are not getting any smaller, and yet there's an infinite number of them. So the summation will diverge by the divergence test. Let's do another one. Again, we will temporarily ignore the summation sign. Polynomials grow faster than logarithms, so the numerator will grow faster than the denominator, and overall, the limit of the individual terms is infinite. Infinity is clearly not zero, so we're adding up an infinite number of things where individually they're getting bigger and bigger, so the summation must also diverge. There's a special series called the harmonic series. It's one plus a half plus a third plus a fourth, etc. It turns out that even though the individual terms of this do approach zero, once you put plus signs in between them and add, that summation actually goes to infinity. This is a surprising fact. Suppose that we group together a third plus a fourth. One third is bigger than one fourth, and this one fourth is just copied down here. So one third plus one fourth is bigger than one half. Moving on to the next couple of terms, one fifth is bigger than an eighth. One sixth is bigger than an eighth. One seventh is bigger than an eighth. And this one eighth is just getting copied down. So overall, these terms right here are bigger than four eighths, or in other words, bigger than a half. Again, same logic over and over again. So what did we just discover? The harmonic series, which is the summation of all of the one over ends going off to infinity is bigger than a half plus a half plus a half plus a half. And we can doing this argument. Each amount that we circle will be bigger than a half by the argument made up above here. Clearly, if I add up a half plus a half plus a half plus a half plus a half, and there's an infinite number of these, I get infinity. So the harmonic series is bigger than infinity. So the harmonic series diverges. Let's do an example. Remember to look for basic algebra that you can do in order to simplify things. You get n minus 1 canceling with n minus 1, and actually this series significantly simplifies. Now here's what I would expect you to write is a little sentence that says, because I know that the harmonic series here diverges, so therefore the total thing diverges, and that's the answer to this problem. What I want you to notice about this example is that the individual terms in the sum do approach zero, so the divergence test cannot be applied. The divergence test only applies if the individual terms of the summation are not zero. Then you can conclude divergence. Remember, the harmonic series was the individual terms of the summation do get closer and closer to zero, but once you start adding those things up, it actually does add up to infinity for series when it's the summation. If the individual terms of the series are not approaching zero, then once you start summing those things up, it will diverge as a series. And then we also have the harmonic series, where the individual terms are approaching zero, but it turns out it actually diverges by the argument that we gave a couple of slides ago. So make sure to review the video a couple more times and see if you can get the logic down. We're going to be doing more and more convergence tests for series in the next few videos. And finally, I just want to point out to you that sequences are essentially reminding you how to do basics of limits series with the summation symbol. That's really what we're going to be studying in this whole chapter. So I hope you enjoyed this video on sequences and series. We'll see you in class soon.